Well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us in our final event of 2021 for Suffrage Forward programs. I'm Paulette Ross, the chair of Suffrage Forward, and I'm joined this evening by the very talented documentary filmmaker, Joe Allen. Hi, Joe. Hi, Paulette. Thanks for having me. You're so welcome. Thanks for um, agreeing to be our guest. Um, but we'll have more about Joe later. Uh, tonight, I just want you all to know that you will be watching the award-winning film that documents a 49-year journey to highlight the horrific assassination of the 11 Israeli Olympians in the 1972 um, uh, Munich Olympics. And you will also be seeing the incredible persistence of two women in their journey and quest to um, make the world aware of what happened and never forget and honor these athletes. You'll also see how the JCC right here in Rockland County uh, joined the fight and became very instrumental in finally getting that one minute of silence. Well, we have a lot to get through this evening. And um, so after the film, I just want you to know that we have a live Q&A. So I really encourage all of you to write your comments and your questions in the chat box at the, at the uh, bottom of your screen. And we will get to as many questions and comments as we possibly can. Um, just note that there are credits rolling that are within the documentary itself. So don't leave, it's not the end of our program. Right after that, We'll be back live, me and Joe on the screen and you and all of your questions. So um, don't leave. And Claire, why don't we just start the film? I'm Anki Spitzer, widow of Andre Spitzer, who together with 10 of his teammates was murdered at the Olympic games in Munich in 1972. For more than 40 years, we, the families of the victims, have walked the long and lonely road in order to get recognition from the International Olympic Committee for a minute of silence at the opening ceremony, but without success. In 2010, David Kerstel, the CEO of the JCC Rockland, he contacted us because he wanted the upcoming JCC Maccabi Games to be dedicated to the memory of the Munich 11. And that began a relationship between the families and the JCC Rockland. miles here from the concentration camp at Dachau, but it is perhaps a measure of the fact that people and times and nations do change that Israel is here. By late summer 1972, the splinter terror group Black September and its sponsors had already spent many months planning for the disruption of the Olympic Games in Munich. Germany was hoping to present to the world the carefree games and would not wield a heavy hand protecting the Olympic Village. The perpetrators of what has come to be known as the Munich Massacre had no idea what their target would be until they were very close to the start of the attack. They only knew the Olympic Village would be vulnerable. So much so that the Israeli delegation formally expressed concern about it. The Israeli team was out the night before the attack, 
enjoying an evening at the theater, and returned home late in the evening. When it was time for the terrorists to attack the Israeli quarters, they got into the village by climbing a six-foot fence with no barbed wire. They blended in with the American and Canadian Olympians, who also hopped the fence as they were coming home way past curfew. After breaking into the village and finding their way to the Israeli quarters, the terrorists found the group that included wrestling coach Moshe Weinberg. He attacked them and was shot in the face. He was seriously wounded. Under great duress, Weinberg led them to the apartment with the weightlifters, likely believing they would be better able to fight the terrorists. As they were moving the weightlifters, Weinberg attacked the terrorists again, and they shot and killed him. But his attack had allowed another wrestler to escape. As the victims were being repositioned, one of them, Josef Romano, lunged for one of the terrorists and was shot and left to bleed to death in front of his teammates. Black September kept demanding the release of 200 imprisoned terrorists, and the Israelis kept rejecting the demand. The games went on through the morning. The president of the IOC, Avery Brundage, wanted no stoppage of the games at all. No interruptions on his watch. Only after many hours, in mid-afternoon, 11 hours into the crisis, did they stop the Olympics. We were eating breakfast. I, uh, I was getting ready to go to the office. That 11 Israelis had been taken hostage. We knew, we did not know who they were. And my father said, well, I have to tell you that there was an attack at the, uh, in the Olympic Village. And, you know, people went into the Israeli houses. The peace of what is what have been called the Serene Olympics was shattered just before dawn this morning, about five o'clock, when Arab terrorists armed with submachine guns, faces blackened, a couple of them disguised as guards or as uh, trash men in the Olympic Village, climbed the fence, went to the headquarters of the Israeli team, and immediately killed one man, Moshe Weinberg, a coach, two shots in the head, one in the stomach. They've been holding 14 others hostage since then. On television, I saw on the second floor, suddenly the, the, the curtains were opened, the windows were opened, and I see Andre in front of the, of, the, of the window. And he was tied with his hands, he was half closed. At least I saw that he was still alive. They asked Andre, how is the situation inside and what is happening? And Andre answered, you know, everybody is okay except for one. And when they asked him who is the one and what happened to him, he wanted to answer. But then he was thrown back into the room. He was hit. I could see that. And they closed the, the windows, they closed the curtains. And that was really the last time I saw him. As the day wore on, both the terrorists and the Germans, feeling the strain of the day, started to look for a way to get everyone away from the village. The decision was made to offer the terrorists a jet out of Munich to Cairo. From the jet, a rescue would be staged. They would leave by helicopter from the Olympic Village to the military airport, first in Feldbruck, where the jet would be. I still remember my mother saying, you know, she said, now it's going to be okay. They're going to take them out and they will be freed. I said, no, mother. They are going to take them out of the Olympic Village because they want, the Germans want to continue with their joyous Olympic Games. They just want to take this thing that was not supposed to happen. They want to take it out of the spotlights and continue. Little equipment was in place. A plan that involved sharpshooters didn't have enough sharpshooters. The roads to the airport were jammed with onlookers. Therefore, additional equipment couldn't arrive. There were no radios available, so individual assets could not communicate with one another. The team pretending to be the flight crew designed to rescue the hostages on the plane took a vote and chose to abandon the operation shortly before the terrorists and their captives got to the airport. But without a radio, they couldn't let anyone know they quit. What's more, 
there was no effective plan in place to disseminate information to the media. The entire German response was a disaster. We've just gotten the final word. You know, when I was a kid, my father used to say, our greatest hopes and our worst fears are mm -hmm. seldom realized. Our worst fears have been realized tonight. They have now said that there were 11 hostages. Two were killed in their rooms this mo yesterday morning. Nine were killed at the airport tonight. They're all gone. It came as subtitles on the television that all the hostages were dead. I spoke to one of the Israeli journalists and I said, I just heard what Jim McKay said. Is that true? And he said, Anki, what Jim McKay said, that's true. She returned to Munich the following morning and attended the memorial service for the victims. Shortly after the memorial, in which Brundage did not even refer to the murdered Israelis in his speech, the games began once again. The head of the games in Munich opposed starting again, as did many athletes. In fact, some entire teams left. Anki went to the apartment to see where Andre was held. It clearly depicted the nightmare her husband and the others had experienced just one day before. So one of the fencers came with me. So we just opened the door and I looked at, uh, we looked inside and, you know, the blood of Josef Romano was just coming down the stairs. So this fencer said to me, please, please don't go up. And I said, I have to see where Andre spent the last hours of his life. I just, I have to see it. And the room was just a complete, chaos, you know, because there was shots of part of the wall came down, blood all over the place because they castrated uh, Yosef Roman uh, in front of his friends because he tried to pick up uh, his machine gun, the Kalachnikov, you know, and, and so that's how they punished him. The bodies were returned to Israel. can't understand it. They murdered in the Olympic village while they were resting for the next competition, for the next day. Prime Minister Golda Meir received the families, telling them their loved ones would not be forgotten. Not by her, not by Israel. Anki wanted the Prime Minister to assure them that she would stay true to her word, that there would be a no-negotiations policy with terrorists. Not long after, Israel attacked terror bases both north and south of Israel. The Prime Minister also authorized Operation Wrath of God, which was created to track down and kill all those involved in the attack. Any athlete in Israel who rises to compete in the Olympic Games knows and understands what the Munich 11 means to the country. I committed to myself that uh, if I will uh, win uh, the Olympic medal, I will dedicate it to uh, the families. I could close a circle in uh, the Israeli sport that uh, the massacre in Munich did, didn't actually stop the Israeli sport. In every event, and it doesn't matter if it's a gala evening or just uh, a meeting of uh, uh, young athletes. Always the, the, the Munich story is part of it. I think in a way sports uh, is it's a mirror to the society. And in Israel it's even uh, in a larger scale. And I think that as a young Olympic athlete, as I mentioned before, you have more responsibility and obligations uh, to represent Israel and to represent the 11 victims and to be to 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 represent the families.
we thought it was the natural thing to do, the first Olympics afterwards, you know, to have a minute of silence. And they said, no, no, there are 22 Arab nations and they will boycott the games if we are going to do this minute of silence. And even the Israeli Olympic Committee, they didn't feel that we had to go to, to Montreal. You can stay here and, and you can cry in Israel. You don't have to go cry in Montreal. I said, what? You don't tell me where to cry. The families would attend each subsequent games, spending their own money to try and get the recognition for their loved ones. The group, led by Anki Spitzer and Ilana Romano, were rebuffed in their efforts by the International Olympic Committee. The future heads of the IOC all rejected the families, including Michael Morris, Juan Antonio Samaranch, and finally Jacques Roja, a Belgian Olympic sailor who competed during the 1972 Munich Games. They all said that recognizing them would be too political. Its time wasn't right, every time. The families, fighting a long and uphill battle against the IOC for their loved one's recognition, were beginning to run out of steam by the time the games in Beijing were over in 2008. They needed allies. The JCC Maccabi Games were created by the JCC Association and Maccabi World Union in 1982 for Jewish youth around the world. Remembering the Munich 11 would be a part of each one. Part of the individual games host's responsibility was to craft the games and the tribute as they best saw fit. I believe that the commemorations and the memorials that we include in the opening ceremonies of every summer's JCC Maccabi Games is a vitally important statement of who we are as a North American Jewish community and who we are as a JCC movement. So when I got to the JCC Association in 1994, I thought this was the opportunity to begin to make this part of every JCC Maccabi Games. It was the right thing to do. Anouk Spitzer was in Washington, D.C. for the opening of the Games in 2004. She was on stage with Jim McKay. Her very presence inspired the audience. For me, it was a great honor to come to a place um, that, that I felt surrounded by warmth and love uh, of the communities in the States. When Jim McKay came, that was for me, unbelievable, because you have to realize he is the face behind the, the, the moment that changed our life forever. The really sad thing is that we still, 32 years later, live in a world that is struck by terror. In 2010, JCC Rockland announced that the 2012 JCC Maccabi Games would be held in Rockland County, just 40 miles north of New York City. Well, for more than 20 years, the JCC was participating in the games, and we were fortunate because they were held everywhere in the country, and all of our uh, teens had an amazing experience and opportunity to participate. And I always felt very strongly that uh, we had a responsibility to host the games as well. So we really had to think about um, what were we going to do to really sear uh, the thoughts of Munich uh, in a positive way. Because until, until I ever came to the JCC in Rockland, we, we were fighting, you know, our fight for a minute of silence, like David against Goliath, you know. It was just too widows, you know, trying to get something done. And everybody thought, eh, you know, they will get remarried, they will get kids, they will go away, you know. But we didn't go away. And so then, when I was invited to Rockland to come and, and, and speak, suddenly I found this incredible community who decided to do something, to, to give us backing, you know, because until then it was just us knocking at everybody's door and nobody listening. Ultimately, the local JCC decided to commit itself to the families in their fight to get a minute of silence. There would be 11 events throughout the year 
leading up to the games, one for each of the victims. So we wanted to really put the, each of their names and who they were in front of the community. The rest of the world had moved on and the families were fighting on their own. As JCC Rockland became more deeply entrenched in the fight for recognition, the mood became one of, why not? Was it really the impossible dream it initially appeared to be, or could the JCC Rockland help the Munich 11 finally get a minute of silence? In September of 2011, JCC held an event to unveil a sculpture by Eric David Laxman, dedicated to the Munich 11, which at that time was one of the very few memorials outside of Israel. As JCC Rockland and the Munich 11 families, collaborative efforts reached more people about the lack of recognition the IOC had given the victims. Many around the world, who were first learning of the 40-year effort, saw that strong anti-Semitism was preventing that body from holding a minute of silence. This was a classic case of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel. The fact that in Vancouver, later on, uh, a Georgian loser died in practice. And they held a minute of silence for him, and they didn't hold a minute of silence for the 11 Israelis, really shows that that was an anti-Semitic action. It is with great sadness that we acknowledge the tragic loss of Noda Kumaritashvili of the Georgian team. We extend our deepest sympathies to his family, his friends, his teammates and countrymen. They are Olympic athletes that went to, to go compete. Th th their dreams, they also felt that, you know, this was the most exciting thing in their lives. They went because we could create a world peace through sport. That was the whole idea of the Olympics. Not everybody felt that way. Those animals came in and all they wanted to do was kill Jews, kill the Olympic team. In order to systematically dismantle the IOC's resistance to the minute of silence, the JCC, through local leadership, would engage its considerable political contacts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in 1972, Palestinian terrorists broke into the Israeli uh, Olympic uh, compound and murdered in cold blood 11 Israeli athletes. In the 40 years since, shamefully, the International Olympic Committee has refused to have a minute of silence uh, to commemorate uh, these 11 martyrs. I thank Senator Gillibrand for her resolution calling on the IOC to hold a moment of silence at the opening ceremonies to remember the 72 massacre. I remind the IOC that it's not too late. We can still pay tribute to these Olympians. It's essential that we help every generation remember what hate, what anti-Semitism, what an anti-Israel focus can result in. We must have this moment of silence to help people remember. In April of 2012, JCC Rockland made a game-changing decision to create an online petition to force the issue even further and undertake an effort to get it around the world. Such a petition, publicly created and disseminated, would give ongoing visibility to the fight for the minute of silence. We were looking at it the old-fashioned way. How do we start a petition? And we were looking at simply uh, people filling out cards saying that they supported a minute of silence. And then one of our board members, Mickey Leader, uh, came to me with the concept that we should do an online petition with an organization called change.org. So we started the online petition. And I remember speaking to Anki Spitzer. She was on vacation. And the expectation was we'd get 500 signatures. Maybe we'd get 1,000 signatures really truly believed if we could get enough awareness and enough PR, enough big names, um, we might be able to do it. And I believed it before we got change.org involved. The petition became the centerpiece of what was being referred to as the Minute of Silence campaign. 
and its call to action was being heard everywhere. Many believe the minute of silence must be getting close at hand when the government of Israel, for the first time ever, made a formal request for a minute of silence at the Olympics. First of all, I was so touched by the dedication, by the vision, by the goodness of, of the people of Rockland to do the right thing. To do the right thing, realizing that it's an uphill battle. But uh, what you in Rockland chose to do is not the easy thing, but the right thing. And I could not but join you right away. We're not afraid to speak truth to power, particularly um, when uh, power has no answer, no rational, no legal, no moral, no ethical answer as to why it won't grant a moment of silence. But we all know the reasons why they won't. When I learned about the role that JCC Rockland had played in support of the families of the Munich 11 around uh, their 2012 efforts here at hosting the games, I was inspired. Despite the developing worldwide clamor for it, in May of 2012, the International Olympic Committee formally rejected Israel's request for a minute of silence. They said they had already done enough to remember the Munich 11 and felt a formal minute of silence at the opening of the games was inappropriate. Between the petition and other people that we reached out to, whether it be the Jewish federations of North America, JCC Association, uh, organizations throughout the world getting on board, the online petition took off. With so many signatures and so much support for it, JCC Rockland leadership made a decision to go to London to hold a press conference demanding the minute of silence. Kirstel reached out to Martin Berliner, chief executive of Maccabi Great Britain. He secured Foreman's Fish Island, a large facility across the street from the Olympic Stadium for the press conference. The effort that we put into this was 125%. I could still see all the people in my office in London and how much they worked, how much they did. And it is amazing because it is not like a huge organization. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a small Jewish community. And they came with us and they supported us when we went to, to offer the, the, all the signatures to the Olympic uh, Committee president. They made so much noise and we had this enormous press conference. But we are asking Jacques Roche to do the right thing. What, what does it take to, to just say at the opening ceremony, let us not forget what happened to the, Isra to the Israeli team. And let us all make sure that this will never happen again. That is what we want. When we made this commitment, it wasn't just a simple statement that we weren't going to stand behind. It was our goal to really work to make a difference. I think all the people of the IOC have forgotten what the Olympic ideal is, because I do believe that people can get together through sports and forget all the conflicts. The campaign has attracted the support of world leaders and parliaments, including, of course, the Knesset, the German Bundestag, the U.S. Congress and President Obama, the parliaments of Canada, of Australia, and others. And I think that press conference was extremely important because it was mentioned all over the place and everybody said that there is something wrong there in the IOC because if so many people ask from so many different backgrounds from so many different countries, you know, why are you not doing it? The group would also deliver the petition directly to IOC President Jacques Roja. He agreed to meet with the group two days before the opening ceremony. Two days before that meeting, Roja held a hastily planned, spontaneous minute of silence in the Olympic Village. Roja agreed to meet with Anki and Alana, as well as the JCC group, 
to discuss the minute of silence and receive the petition. That meeting, which took place at the IOC offices in London, was cordial at first. Roja accepted the petition, which was placed on his table with a literal thud. Anki and Alana told Roja this was his last opportunity to make things right and hold a minute of silence. And I'm speaking in, 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 in Dutch with him and in English and in French and the, all, all kinds of languages just to get the message through. 55 minutes of, you know, I, I thought I was, you know, I exhausted. We said to him, would this have happened, you know, this, this endless journey to get justice? Would, if, would this have happened if it was about the American Dream Team, Michael Phelps, if something, you know, God forbid, would happen to him or to Bryant or Kobe, or to all these people that are well-known Americans or Germans or whatever, if, if something would have happened to them, you also would not have done this minute of silence. Then he looked at me and he said, yeah, maybe I would have. I said, you see, so it's only because they are Israelis, they are Jews. He said, my hands are tight. I said, no, 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 your hands are not tight. The hands of my husband and of his teammates and also their legs, they were tight. He leans over the table and he says, Anki, I'm not going to do it. So, I said, Ilana, we are out of here. Partially in response to Roja's rejection of the remembrance, minutes of silence were held in locations all over the world. There were more than 10,000 stories in the week leading up to the Olympic Games about the Munich 11. Despite the IOC's rejection yet again, broadcaster Bob Costas mentioned the minute of silence as the Israeli team marched in the opening ceremonies. He did what must have seemed endless to second-by-second -second programmers of the Olympics. He went silent for six full seconds as the Israeli team marched by. The Israeli athletes now enter behind their flag bearer, sailor Shahar Zubari. These games mark the 40th anniversary of the 1972 tragedy in Munich, when 11 Israeli coaches and athletes were murdered by Palestinian terrorists. There have been calls from a number of quarters for the IOC to acknowledge that, with a moment of silence at some point in tonight's ceremony. The IOC denied that request, noting it had honored the victims on other occasions, and in fact this week, Jack Rogan led a moment of silence before about 100 people in the athletes' village. Still, for many, tonight, with the world watching, is the true time and place to remember those who were lost and how and why they died. We're back to London after this. Bob Costas gave us the minute of silence. Uh, I do believe that he was aware of our petition. Uh, I, I, you know, reading interviews over the years, uh, he felt that this should be recognized, you know, the, the murder should be recognized. Uh, I think he took a big gamble. Uh, he did it without, from what I understand, without NBC's permission, but he felt so strongly about it. It, it shocked the world that such a high profile personality with millions of people watching it, he made that statement. In one of the game's most inspirational moments, U.S. gymnast Ali Raisman won a gold medal, performing with Hava Nagila as her music. Afterwards, she dedicated it to the Munich 11. It was just kind of another question I was answering, and then when I got back home, I started going to a lot of Jewish community centers and doing speeches and meeting so many amazing people, and they all kind of were explaining to me that it, it was a big deal and I realized that as I've, you know, gone home from London. Near the end of the games in London, a ceremony for the Munich 11, attended by more than 600 people, was contentious and highlighted the differences between the families and the soon-to-be-retiring IOC head, Jacques Roja. You are discriminating against them only because they are Israelis and Jews. 
So shame on you, International Olympic Committee, because... Because you have forsaken the 11 members of your Olympic family. The event was organized by the National Olympic Committee of Israel, the Jewish Committee for the London Games, and the Israeli Embassy in London. In the years following the 2012 Olympics, two dramatic events took place. A permanent memorial in Munich, where the Israelis were kidnapped, was dedicated in August of 2017. It was funded by the Bavarian government and the IOC. In addition, the IOC announced that there would be a memorial in the Olympic Village in Rio de Janeiro to the victims during the 2016 Olympics, and the physical structure would be moved to each subsequent game site. There would also be a ceremony in the village to honor all those who died in the Olympics. We commemorate them especially because this was an attack not only on our fellow Olympians, but also an assault on the values that the Olympic village stands for. It was an attack on the universal power of sport to unite all of humanity in peace and solidarity. We honor and remember you forever in our hearts. David Berger, Seif Friedman, Josef Butfer, Elisa Halfin, Josef Roman, Amitsur Shapira, Gerhard Scholl, Mark Slavin, Andre Spitzer, Jakob Springer, Moshe Weinberg, Anton Fliegelbaum. Dear Thomas Bach, we always felt and believed that you would be the one to make this historic step forward. We knew that you had it in your heart and that you had the courage to bring justice and recognition to our loved ones within the framework of the Olympic Games. We want this minute of silence. And he said to me, the only thing I don't want is the same chaos that this JCC from Rockland organized, you know, in London, and all the, 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 the thousands of emails and letters and, and telephone calls and, and Obamas and Prince Charles and everybody that got, got into the, the thing. If this I don't want. I said, it is no problem. You don't have to get it. So do the right thing. We said we are going to accept it for now because we think it is, I think it is an historic, step forward in the right direction. I said, you know what we want. We want the minute of silence at the opening ceremony because this is a big deal. This is not thousands of people. That's millions of people, you know, who see the opening ceremony. And I think it's a great idea having that ceremony every single year, but it has to follow one opening ceremony where they give the team, the athletes, a minute of silence. That's not asking for too much. And then they could have that ceremony every year and everybody would be happy. And, and then Thomas Bach wouldn't have to worry that uh, there'll be all that turmoil because that's about the only way he's going to stop it. What people don't get really is the magnitude of what happened in Munich. Um, there was terrorism. This should never be any terrorism. Uh, at the Olympics, you have athletes that come there, the best athletes of, of each country, and they should be worried about their lives? That's wrong. I think we made a dramatic impact. I really actually believe that without our involvement, what happened in 2012 would not have happened. I think it's very simple. I think if you believe in something, and if you, especially when you think that injustice has been done, not to me, but to also to other people, that you are not going to give up until justice has been done. It's not only that she was willing to come for him, but after what happened, she's willing to fight for him.
for almost 50 years. They were only married one year and three months. And the fact that she made this her life work, um, obviously for him, because she knows that he deserves it. The 2012 effort for a minute of silence was a success by virtually every measurement. So many people around the world participated in the effort to remember the Munich 11. People who never knew about Munich came on board. The efforts of spring 2012 were only part of the long road the families have walked. But the events of that year assured that these men will never be forgotten. Anki Spitzer and Alana Romano have continued to face off against the IOC, despite both women having gone on to lead full and productive lives. The JCC and David Kirstel have continued to remain closely allied with Anki and Alana. He has continually pushed for the minute of silence denied to the widows in 2012 and 2016. Anki and Alana have stayed a course over decades for a cause they know to be right. They have never given up and they never will. I learned that if you keep fighting for what is right, you will be heard. To commemorate what have happened there because it's not a matter only of the Israelis. It's a matter of the whole world, of the free world. It's not only the war against terrorism, it's uh, the war for humanity. There was no silence. And because they couldn't give us one minute of silence, they've got a whole lot to look forward to in terms of loud voices speaking up making certain that in 2020, there will be silence. The leadership and the community support made it happen. And, and without that, no one's gonna win. But with that, everyone can take on every giant. There, there's nothing out there that you can't achieve. You may not be successful. We weren't per se, but we did make noise. And that noise did make a difference. The next games are in Tokyo in 2020, and the families and their partners are once again prepared to take the fight to the IOC. In retrospect, JCC Rockland embarked on a mission few believed had any chance of success. Despite not seeing an actual minute of silence, the effort brought people all around the world together and caused enough agitation in the hallways of the IOC that eight years after London, the moment of silent acknowledgement at the opening ceremonies is closer than ever. I think there's a presumption that when something big needs doing, somebody big needs to do it. Or if it's gonna be done right, it has to be done methodically and deliberately and with a huge amount of preparation and planning. I think what we find in life is that moments come that offer an opportunity to stand up and be counted. And we're not always sure how it's going to go or how we're going to do it, but when we recognize the moment and step into it, we begin to explore the possibility of doing things that we never thought were possible. I think that's the story of the Rockland JCC and its work on behalf of the families of the Munich 11. I think that tells every community everywhere that we should be ready when the moment comes to stand up and be counted if there's a chance to lead and do right. Neither the families in Israel nor JCC Rockland in the U.S. have any intention of walking away until the minute of silence is held. In the Olympic Stadium, during the opening ceremonies, and in front of the entire world. It was one of the most exciting times I've ever dealt with because we actually made a worldwide impact. There may have been no minute of silence at the London Olympics but there was no silence. We remember those who lost their lives 
during the Olympic Games. One group still hold a strong place in all our memories and stand for all of those we have lost at the Games. The members of the Israeli delegation at the Olympic Games Munich 1972. And for all of us here in the stadium, we invite you to stand for this moment of silence. Mokto. Thank you. Onawari kudasai. Oh, no. um, that was so powerful. My mind is just racing with questions and, and comments on, on this film. Um, but to all of you, let me please first introduce formally Joe Allen, um, tell you something about him before we get into our live Q&A. Um, so Joe has spent most of his career uh, involved in community activism and philanthropy. Um, he currently retired uh, as senior VP of the Employee Communications and uh, Community Affairs, Employee, co yeah, Communications and Community Affairs um, of Active International, which is a global uh, trading company. He was the founder of Active Cares. Uh, which um, was a, a, a company that um, actually did cause-related programs that supported close um, to, I would say, about 700 charitable organizations. Joe currently serves on the board of directors of People to People, um, which is Rockland's largest food hub uh, in Nanuet as well as on the board of Good Samaritan Hospital Foundation and uh, Rockland Community Foundation. Uh, as an award-winning documentary filmmaker, uh, Joe has directed and produced such films as 20 Million Minutes, Hudson Valley Honor Flight, Generation Bridge, Big Apple Honor Flight, and Two Schools in Hilburn, which Suffrage Forward actually highlighted and had a, held a screening and a live Q&A about two years ago. Uh, these are amongst some of the films that Joe has done. Currently, he's residing in Tompkins Cove in New York, where he is president of Hudson Cove Group, Inc. And he's currently working on a new documentary and that's going to be about hunger, I believe, um, uh, hunger in suburbia, and it's entitled Empty Cupboards, um, and it's dealing with the impact of hunger uh, on our society. Um, so now, uh, you know, without further ado, let me formally introduce you in the audience to Joe Allen. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, get a chance to watch that film again. It, it is as powerful 
and the memory of uh, all it took to to make the film and all it took to get the uh, minute of silence done comes back uh, in, a, in a great way. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, and we appreciate seeing this and learning about it. I mean, I remember I remember when it happened and I thought it was horrifying, but now to hear and see the backstory um, and the persistence of these two women and the inclusion of Rockland's JCC right here, um, it makes it even more overwhelming and important and um, amazing. So, so Joe, uh, what drew you to this project initially? I mean, well, <laughs> uh, David Kirstel, who is the CEO of JCC Rockland, um, had had a meeting with me, uh, and it was his intent on trying to have Active be a sponsor of the JCC Maccabi Games in 2012. And he, we talked about it at length, and there really wasn't a nonprofit um, element in there an immediate needs element, which is what ACTIVE always went for, uh, it, to uh, be part of that. So we, we initially backed away and David and I continued to talk and continued to talk and came up with the idea that any profit on the JCC Maccabi games in Rockland would go to Feed the Hungry, both in Rockland County and in Israel. So at that point, we had something to hang our hat on. So in the subsequent meetings to uh, work on this uh, sponsorship of the JCC Maccabi Games, I, I said to David, um, what happens at the JCC Maccabi Games? And he said, he said there's sports and all that, but every, every games begins with uh, some program on behalf of the Munich 11, which I remembered the story of the Munich 11. And as we were talking, uh, I said, have you thought about documenting the JCC Maccabi games and the Munich 11 memorial that would be done prior to the games? And he said, well, no, not really. And we talked about it. And, it, and then from there, the idea of, of making a, a documentary um, popped up, but it really came alive as the JCC Rockland added more and more effort on a local level and on a national level to get this minute of silence done. It was, a, it was magnetic. The more, the more David brought to the table, the more I couldn't wait to tell it. And the more uh, there, was, there was energy about it, the, the, the better it was. And then when we decided, when, when David and Mickey Leader decided to do a, an online petition, this thing caught fire. And uh, it began to go not only around Rockland or around New York or around the country, but around the world. And it became such an exciting thing to be a part of. I can't, I can't tell you how, uh, uh, how exciting it was. So... Uh, it started out with a conversation and it concluded with a minute of silence in Tokyo. Now, how did you meet Anki, who is, a, 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 I'm in awe of what she and Alana uh, went through and that 49 year journey, but how did you meet her? And what, what did you I, feel when you first met this amazing woman? I, I agree with you. She's pretty amazing. And she has what I consider to be the weight of uh, the same kind of weight that she carried that Jackie Kennedy carried they, when, when JFK got, got shot. Mm -hmm. she, she had no intention of being this. She was a 26 year old young woman with a, with a, a brand new baby, weeks mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. and, and she had no intention of being in the spotlight for this, but yet there she was. And she felt uh, so strongly, and Ilana Romano did too, that somebody has to acknowledge what happened to their husbands. And they just began to, to, to fight. And everything that Anki has done um, has made me appreciate what diligence and what persistence really does. And, and 
and I know it worked that that concept it, it works for for suffrage forward because persistence and and is the name of the game and and suffrage which is what well, was a hundred years old recently uh, came because of not giving up and Anki and Alana refused to give up and it was a pleasure and inspiring to be around them I find it fascinating how straightforward she was and not intimidated by um, these people in power, you know, to just tell it like it is, like, don't tell me where to cry and uh, just do the right thing, things like that. Did that uh, intimidate you in any way? Um, no, it didn't. No, it didn't intimidate me from the moment I met her when she came to Rockland for the first time. Uh, she was very special to me, uh, very special to anyone who met her. Mm -hmm. I never saw anyone in my life who was able to uh, draw other people into her circle at at one time, and and we became great great friends. She's she's a very special friend to me, even though I I don't see her that much anymore. But she is really a a, a go getter and 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 led this fight uh, against all odds. Look, they they spent their own money to go mm. to all those Olympic games until uh, in. Um, uh, in Rio, the Israeli, a, a, the IOC paid for them, uh, the, and the Israeli team paid for them. Uh, other than that, they were spending their own money. And the only reason they wanted to do that is to get their loved ones a minute of silence. The amazing thing also is that she passed it on, you know, like these women that we have highlighted through the two years of Suffrage Forward, uh, she passed it on to her daughter because um, her daughter Anouk um, was pretty powerful also when she was on stage with Jim McKay and inspired even more uh, people to get on board and join, join the quest. Well, there, there was no doubt that, that Anouk and, and um, Ilana Romana's daughter Shlomit would uh, carry the ball if it didn't happen in Anki and, Alana, and Alana's lifetime. Mm -hmm. And Anouk was a star of this whole story. Uh, the, the fact that she was an infant when this took place became a central, a central part of the way this story was told. And she was, she was uh, part of it. And when she was on stage with Jim McKay, it, it, it really brought the house to tears. And when I went to Israel to, to interview her, her passion for what her mother did stood out. And there was no doubt that Anouk was going to carry the ball until the ball crossed the goal line. You're on mute, by the way, Paulette. Just sign. <laughs> uh, so from a technical point of view, um, how, with, with so much information and so many photographs and, and uh, videos, film uh, uh, documenting this, this entire process and this journey. How were you, um, or how did you end up editing uh, this film down so that it's pal palatable to, to people to not be watching six hours of, of film, but to just highlight the real importance and the main the main pictures and film and so on and so forth to make the point. And well, you, you first do it and you put everything that you feel needs to be in it. And you, you take a look at it and you go, wow, I got four hours of, of, of film here. Can't have that. And then you, you cut it down and you change the script and you look for things that will, will tell the story better. And uh, you know, I, I I had a really good team. We have a really good team um, to do these films. And uh, we just dove in and you dive in and you just want to tell it. Now, part of it was to make it under, to make this film under 50 minutes because mm -hmm. we wanted it to be uh, available in schools and uh, as, a, as a, a teaching tool. And, and it was. But, um, you know, you could go on and on and on forever with, with this story. Just 
just the kidnapping and the and the, the tragic murder uh, could take up a couple of hours. So many things went wrong in that whole deal. Oh my gosh, yes. I, I, I mean, it just, it really is amazing to just see it. And I've now watched this film a, a few times and each time there's something new that um, I didn't hear or realize or, um, or get while I was watching everything else because I was processing everything that I was seeing in this amazing documentary. So what did it feel like when in Tokyo, because I'm, I'm sure that you were up first at the crack of dawn, you know, instead of seeing the replay of the opening. Yeah, uh, what I did was. it feel like when you saw that? <clears throat> well, the thing I, is, the thing is, uh, Aki and Alana were not tipped off in advance. No. They had no idea. Everyone had an inkling when they got invited by Thomas Bach to come to Tokyo, which is a long way from Israel. Uh, and and I, I, we all felt that they wouldn't be bringing them on such a journey in, in the COVID world without, uh, without there being a payoff. So I had a, a little bit of hope. But NBC carried it live at 7 a.m. They replayed it in the evening primetime. But I was up at 5. Uh, we had David Kerstell and I had been uh, talking to one another, and we heard from Anki and Alana, saw a photograph that they posted of them in, in the stadium. And, and we just didn't know. I, I tell you candidly, I was just hoping that if they were going to do it, they did it early because I didn't want to go through all three hours of the opening, <laughs> the opening. waiting for it. But then about 20 minutes in, they did the minute of silence. And I, I, I was laying in bed with, with amazement and I started crying. Sure. Anki you know, called and said, we were, we were in tears in the stadium. And I said, well, I was in tears in Tompkins Cove. Yeah. It was just, it was just an ex, uh, an explosion of relief. Mm. I, I just wanted to say that um, we have a special guest. David Kerstell is with us today, so if it's okay, I'd like to bring him on to to share his thoughts a little bit. Is that all right? Oh, please yeah. do, and let me encourage the rest of the audience. Please put in your comments and your questions so that we can get to them, and you can ask Joe and. You know, maybe there's a question for David, but David, hi, you're on mute. Can I just just say before David begins that that none of this happens without David. I know he's often said the same thing that it doesn't happen without the film, but without his insight and without his bravery to attack this, none of this would happen. Well, welcome, David. Hello, Congratulations, Paula. and um, you know we can only say th thank you for your foresight and fortitude, um, and bringing Joe on to to make this amazing documentary, so that the rest of the world hopefully will get to see all of this. Well, I would I would tell you, Paula, uh, thank you, and uh, you know the beauty of of an effort like this is, as Joe said. Um, you really get to meet people that are special. And uh, when Joe talks about Anki and you can, you can feel her passion very quickly, which Joe is absolutely right. She's even more remarkable than Joe describes. And, um, and I have to tell you, I've watched the movie a lot of times and I watched it from the beginning again tonight. But I, I have to tell you that uh, for me, it was like uh, finding a brother in Joe Allen uh, in working with him. Although, quite frankly, we both snore when we went to Israel together um, <laughs> a couple of times. Um, and I won't tell any other stories, Joe, about uh, our trips to Israel. Um, but, Paulette, as you know, Joe is a master storyteller. Absolutely. And uh, you could listen to Joe for hours. And he just tells... Uh, tells a terrific story. So uh, um, for me, um, it's 
the experience that we went through, not only was it amazing for what we accomplished, but by getting to work with people like Joe and Anki, um, it really was an inspiring time. And how did you feel when you saw that minute of silence finally given? Um, it, it's an unreal feeling, surreal, because in 2012, in many ways, we accomplished, I felt like we accomplished more in 2012. You know, the power of seeing governments all around the world standing up, mm -hmm. um, the power of uh, the Israeli government standing up and asking for the minute of silence, which they had not done previously, and the excitement that went straight through to um, being in the office of uh, Jacques Roja um, and delivering the petition. Um, so the impact of what we did was actually in many ways more powerful, um, but still, you know, to finally conclude and get that minute of silence uh, was mind boggling. And, you know, Joe and I will both talk about the fact that um, Jacques Roja had an opportunity to be a hero. Um, he was running scared towards the end when he had the uh, minute of silence in the Olympic Village with 100 people. He was trying to find a way to satisfy people because for 40 years, um, it had just been the two widows that had, had asked for the minute. And yeah. now the whole world was standing up against him and he just couldn't pull the trigger. And so for, for us, it was really meaningful that not only did the minute of silence happen, but Jacques Rocha was around afterwards to see it happen. And then subsequently he passed away. Like yes. weeks later. Yeah. So, so um, you know, again, all the lessons that Anki talked about, never giving up, um, there's nothing you can say. For, for two young widows to fight any cause, let alone the International Olympic Committee. I mean, that's like the UN. I mean, to fight that body for 49 years all alone and never give up, it just tells you that there's nothing you can't accomplish if you don't put an effort into it. And I think that lesson uh, quite frankly, is the more important lesson now in the world we live in today for everybody, the next generation and everybody to understand that one voice can make a difference. Well, persistence, you know, um, we've seen it. If you look at history, you know, that's what gets things done. And we thank you again so much for, um, for joining the fight and making it happen, help to make it happen. So, you know, again, thank you, thank you. Listen, and, and, th and thank you, Paulette. And again, at the end of the day, everybody made a difference. But without Anki and Alana, quite frankly, after Montreal in 1976, they go away, nobody ever hears about this. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just a distant memory for older people. And so the International Olympic Committee, quite frankly, made a bad mistake. Yeah. If they simply would have acknowledged it in 1976, taken one minute, it would have been all over. Yeah, that's so. true. That's true. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Paulette. Thank you. So, Joe, um, well, let's see. Do we have any questions, comments from the audience? Claire, what do you uh, see back there? Uh, we, let's see, we're just awaiting a few questions. Um, okay. We have a question for Joe. Um, when you when you started doing this, were, were you sort of daunted by the process? Did it seem like uh, this was just gonna be too much to tell in a, in, a, in a documentary format? Yeah, I was really daunted by it. <laughs> you know, this is a, <clears throat> this is a big, it was a big issue, it's a big deal. And as, as uh, uh, David said, um, you, you stand up and fight the UN 
and Anki and Alana had been fighting them for many years. I hadn't. And it was one of those moments in, in life where you, you do have to stop and say, how did I get here? Why, how, am I, how am I doing this? How am I standing in the Knesset getting an award from the Israeli government? Or how, how are, we, are we in the um, uh, 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 up at watching the JCC Maccabi games uh, in, um, in northern Israel? I mean, there are, there are things that we never would have done. But I, like I said before, every time this got bigger, we got more excited. And, and once, once it took off, we were ready. We didn't know what, what was coming our way. We didn't know what was around the corner, but we just got ready. And, and uh, you know, thanks to the leadership of the JCC, uh, we never stopped. We always, we just kept going. David, do you have, what's your next project <laughs> for the next uh, 49 years? <laughs> well, I, I would tell you, Paulette, there are two things. So first of all, um, this year at our founder celebration, uh, our theme this year is commitment. And uh, one of our two honorees is Anki Spitzer, um, because there's nobody more committed than Anki. So uh, Anki will be coming to Rockland, her adopted community, uh, for breakfast at the JCC on May the 1st. So we have that. And then the second project, which I actually am, believe is, is, you could almost say it's the more important project, believe it or not, Paulette, and Anki actually agrees with me. It's trying to take the movie and the lessons of what we've learned from this, the lessons of never giving up, the lessons of why take on a 40-year-old cause like we did that most people don't seem to care about, the lesson of one person can make a difference. We need to teach that lesson, frankly, to the world because we're living in a broken world today. And in many cases, people think their voices cannot and don't make a difference. So I think we have a responsibility and Anki wants to join with us, with Joe, to take on the responsibility to try to get the word out in a major way to as large an audience as possible. Because frankly, where there are problems in the world, we all need to stand up or quite frankly, the problems will continue and get worse. So, so that would be the plan. And that's a huge plan, yeah. uh, but a plan worth fighting for if we're going to care about what this world's going to look like for our kids and our kids' kids. Absolutely. So, you know, Jeff I'm, I'm, Paul, yeah. let me, let me just add something. Um, yeah, David mentioned that it was a, uh, a an effort throughout the the JCC, and that's very true. So many people who were part of JCC Rockland contributed something. They 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 uh, wore a t shirt. They they donated money. They 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 did something, and it was never a time during the whole making of this film where I didn't feel. Um, a special bond with the entire JCC Rockland community. Um, and it's not, it's not a, a religious bent, it's a, it's a hum human bent. And that's what we felt about from the entire JCC community. David or, or Steve Gold or Mickey Leader might, might have played uh, top roles, but so many, so many people at JCC Rockland were involved. Mm -hmm. And um, here in the county, this documentary won an award. So, um, <coughs> you know, that's kudos to you, Joe, uh, Thank you. for your talent and, and um, ability, really, to create such an amazing, powerful documentary. So let me ask you, um, Joe, what what's your takeaway what's what's your advice what 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 can we learn um in from from all of this in today's world and this wonderful divisive climate that we're in paulette you i think you know it 
I think you know it from suffrage forward. The, the takeaway is never give up. If you believe in something, you, you go at it and you keep going at it and keep going at it until you cross the finish line with it. Mm-hmm. Many times, so many times, this, this whole deal could have been uh, derailed. But, every, but, but Anki and Alana and David just stayed on the, stayed on the tracks. And persistence, diligence, and getting the word out to people about it is uh, the most important. And that's, that's the greatest lesson I take away from this, let alone the fact that, you know, there are the larger, uh, meaningful uh, things you want to say, like you know, we should, should be world peace and things like that. Right. But from a purely operational point of view, the persistence is what blew my mind. I think, Claire, we have a question or a comment, I think. I'm seeing one. Yes, uh, the question is, uh, I now have three new heroes, Anki, the JCC Rockland, and you, Joe. This is from Penny. Thank you so much for bringing this powerful story forward. I'm shaken by it. What are the plans for spreading this story more widely? <clears throat> uh, well, I'll, I'll address that and then David can address it too. Uh, we're working closely with the JCC Association um, to make this a teaching tool um, around the world. This was this was a nonprofit project, so profit motive wasn't really involved in this. Education is what's in what's involved, and the JCC Association um, is working closely with us to develop not only a pathway to get this shown, but um, a curriculum uh, that, that can be utilized in schools and communities about this and what, what the Munich 11 lessons are and how we could all be better because of it. Uh, David? Uh, well, we said it before, you know, again, uh, and what you just said, Joe. So, uh, you know, frankly, uh, we all have full-time jobs. The issue is, is how do we um, you know, the ideal situation is uh, uh, to identify like-minded funders. Uh, that's what it takes to get these messages out uh, if we want to get out in a big way. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, JCC Association will be able to identify resources so that uh, uh, the long-term impact. And again, by the way, um, I spoke to Anki the other day. I'm going to Israel the end of this month, and I'll be seeing her in Israel. Uh, she is, uh, um, we, we call her my second wife, uh, <laughs> my older wife. Um, but it's going to be 50 years this year, and Anki has told me she is being approached by TV crews from all over the world who want to be involved in the story of the 50th anniversary of this tragedy. So um, there's a natural opportunity here, I think, to keep the story out in the public. And although uh, I, I'm not sure what Aki's plans will be, you know, does she need to rush to every set of games now going forward since mm-hmm. it's happened? We don't know, but I think the legacy really needs to be about uh, spreading the message and we have to figure out how to get that done. Right, so you're not thinking, um, I mean, do you think that she wants it to be commercially out there or more as um, a documentary and, and yeah, yeah, I think I think I think it's it's more about spreading spreading the information. I, you know, I think it's a very involved process to really get that message out in a big way. Mm-hmm. So I don't think we have the answer yet, um, but hopefully we'll get the answer and we'll work it out. So who do you want to play you? <laughs> Now, listen, by the way, there's a Will Smith documentary coming up. Uh, there's lots of different documentaries coming uh, about the subject, for sure. Yeah. It's very important. I mean, we, we can't forget these things. Um, we shouldn't. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and we need to learn from them, I think. I mean, that's, that to me is a big takeaway, to get the word out so that we can learn. We don't make these mistakes over and over and over again. Um, it seems, you know, this thing of history repeating itself drives me crazy because 
if you're we're that smart, why don't we get it? You're absolutely right, Paula. Yeah. Well, um, and we have we just have one final question. It's sure. uh, for David. Uh, it might be a bold question, she writes, but is one minute of silence really enough? That's a great um, well, it's a great question. Um, I don't I don't necessarily believe one minute of silence is ever enough. Um, but I think I think it, it's the message of recognition. And the fact that the recognition took place, what they needed was one minute. They, they needed an acknowledgement of the importance. And I think an acknowledgement happening 50 years later says something different than an acknowledgement that happens right after the fact. Um, I think it's actually in many ways much more powerful. So um, I don't think it's ever enough when you have 11 lives that were lost tragically simply for wanting to compete in the Olympics. Um, but I think one minute, which is what the families wanted and what the families asked for, in this case, it is enough. Joe, your thought on that? Yeah, no, I think you're, abs I think you're absolutely right. The success of the ultimate success of the minute of silence uh, serves as a beacon. It's not it's not the entire thing, obviously. It just puts a picture of, uh, 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 of a moment on the wall for everybody to see. Now it's up to us to make something out of this in the future. And whether we do or whether we don't, I don't know. But as far as uh, this making of, of uh, there was no silence, it, it was clear that... Uh, their battle became our battle and nobody was going to give in. And the IOC ultimately gave in. Listen, they were due the respect. And that one minute, if it was only one minute, it was about respect. Yeah. Uh, you're right on target, Paulette. Perf perfectly said. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, for coming and, um, and, you know, allowing us to have you as a little panelist there at the end. Uh, and thanks for all of your efforts. And um, I, I get to come in May and um, and meet Anki. I would love to. She, I'm, and you would love Paulette. She is an unbelievable person. You'll, you would love, we'd love to see you on May 1st. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, Joe, what can I say? Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, a most powerful you know, award-winning documentary film. Um, of course, I wish you, and we all wish you success in getting this um, out there to the world and also success in your, in what you're working on now is your project. Mm -hmm. Another uplifting thing, hunger <laughs> and what it does to our society. Um, um, by the way, yes, I've done uh, films on hunger. I've done things on films on, or I'm doing one on hunger. I've done things on civil rights. I've done things on uh, World War II veterans. People who know me go, why, do you, why are you staying in these dark topics? Why don't you do one on football or baseball or rock and roll? Or, and I said, well, yeah, I probably will. So maybe I will. Maybe I'll move out of this into, uh, into happy subjects. Okay. Um well, if you want to learn more about the JCC, just go online and look at their website um, and send in any questions that you have or go visit. It's a beautiful, beautiful. facility. It really is. Um, and if you want to know more about Joe, well, just check out um, his Facebook page, the Hudson Cove Group. Okay. And you can learn more about him and all of the documentaries that he has done. Uh, again, thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, Joe, uh, for allowing us to screen this amazing movie. And I want to say special thanks to Claire Sheridan, who's that voice from beyond <laughs> who comes in and interrupts us. She is um, our technical expert, and uh, she has done an amazing job throughout the year uh, with um, putting on these uh, webinars and also 
doing our PR and our advertising. So and thank you, Claire. Yes, Paulette, I, let me just take a moment to salute the work that you do. You're the founder of this great organization, or one of them, okay? Uh, you've done so much to keep, keep the concept of what it took to win suffrage, and uh, I appreciate it on behalf of my grandmother, on behalf <laughs> of all the women in my family, and on behalf of myself. So thank you for what you do. Oh, well, you're welcome. Believe me, it's, it's in my bones. So it's frustrating sometimes, but um, I just believe so much in the mission. Um, and I wanna thank all of you in our audience um, for your support and hope that you continue to support Suffrage Forward so that we can um, present all of these wonderful um, programs and events to highlight the persistence and the strength in the pursuit of equality for all. So I wanna wish you all um, healthy and happy holidays and um, it's onward to 2022. Right. Thank you again, Paulette. You're Thank so you, welcome. Paulette. See you Bye, soon. everybody. Bye-bye.